Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, today. So my name is Shada Wang. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Higher School of Public Policy. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Zhu Guohe for inviting me to join the discussion and each of you for joining the China in Today's World seminar series. Uh, it's with great pleasure to bring everyone together today. And today's discussion is about carbon neutrality and the Chinese economy. So our moderator for the discussion will be Dr. Kevin Mo. So Kevin is a former managing director of the Policy Institute Beijing Representative Office, uh, where he was in charge of climate, energy, and sustainable urbanization. He has more than 25 years of experience in strategizing and implementing climate and energy policies in both the US and China. He previously also served as the senior director of IPIC China, which stands for uh, the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. And in addition to Kevin, we also have two distinguished panelists today uh, joining our discussion. So first we have uh, Dr. Zhou Ji, who is the CEO and president of Energy Foundation China, uh, with many years of experience in economics, energy, environment, climate change, and policy making. Professor Zhou is highly regarded in the climate and clean energy space, where he previously served as a deputy director uh, general of China's National Center for Climate Change Strategy and International Cooperation uh, under the government's National Development and Reform Commission, focusing on China's low carbon development strategy and policy, and also led uh, international climate negotiations and collaboration. So he has experienced extensive experience working at international, national, and also at uh, the local levels. And second, we also have Dr. Ma Jun, who is the founder and president of Institute of Finance and Sus Sustainability, which is based in Beijing. He is also the chairman of Green Finance Committee of China Society for Finance and Banking. He's the co-chair of G20 Sustainable Finance Study Group and co-chair of the steering committee of the Green Investment Principles for the Belt and Road. Previously, Dr. Ma also uh, served as the director of the Center for Finance and Development at Tsinghua University, uh, served as the chief economist at the People's Bank of China, uh, research bureau, and a member of the Central Bank's uh, Macro Prudential Committee. So now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Mo, who will start the discussion. Great, great um, to be here. And thank you for inviting the two speakers and me to these great panels. And uh, we are very lucky to have uh, very good the top experts in China. Uh, climate experts in China, one is on financing, another one is for uh, is on the climate policies uh, to come here to discuss um, about China's new, uh, carbon neutralities, uh, which which is which is a great topic right now, very hot topic right now. So um, uh, let, let me first ask a, a professor um, uh, Zhou Ji, um, could you uh, briefly uh, just describe? Uh, China's commitment of the peak, uh, to peak carbon emissions by 2030 and reach carbon neutrality by 2060? Um, and how crucial is it to China's economic development? Thank you, everyone. Uh, so pleased uh, to be here to share my view uh, with you uh, on Chinese climate policy. Uh, I would say, oh, number one, I want to correct uh, a little bit uh, the the target and uh, to peak before rather than by twenty thirty, okay. yeah, and Good. also uh, okay. reach to the neutrality before twenty sixty. But certainly okay. before is uh, something, uh, maybe it can reach a five years time span or something. But essentially, uh, I I think, uh, uh for peaking, uh, I mean for the target, uh, of peaking. It's not something new. Uh, in fact, China uh, started to uh, to commit uh, picking target. Uh, let me say, oh, uh, about uh, seven years ago. I mean, uh, in uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2014. I mean, when President Obama visited to Beijing. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the the two presidents of China and the US launched a joint statement. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, it was the first time for China to commit a picking, um, a, a picking target. Uh, but uh, uh, seven years ago, China committed 
uh, reaching peaking uh, emission uh, around 2030. But be, be careful. I mean, uh, the difference of the the single word. I mean, around 2030 and before 2030. Uh, in the context of Chinese uh, policy, this is a big change. Uh, but certainly, we still under debate uh, what the exact uh, date or years uh, to reach peaking. Uh, say, uh, if it it will be uh, 2029 or if it will be 2025. Uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, still under uh, debate. And uh, no need to say the structure or indicators of the uh, the commitment include uh, picking, uh, picking time, and also uh, uh, reduction of uh, carbon intensity, and also the uh, instill the capacity of uh, wind and the solar power, uh, as well as uh, uh, carbon sink by land use and the forestry. So the, the, those are the uh, Chinese commit, uh, climate commitment uh, in the multilateral forum. Uh, but I, uh, the last thing I want to emphasize is uh, this, uh, this is not only the matter of uh, climate targets itself. Uh, that means that you should not regard that commitment as only a single uh, environmental or climate policy. Rather, it is a matter of uh, economic development, especially a matter of uh, restructuring and upgrading the economy by, uh, by, uh, by the improvement of efficiency, and the new driver of economic growth. So this is my very brief uh, understanding of Chinese uh, climate policy target. I stop here. Thank you. So Professor Zhou, um, so what does China's commitment mean um, for the world uh, to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees um, Celsius? Um, in fact, uh, given the fact that China uh, is the top one emitter and the top two economy, and also uh, we also see the potential, huge potential for China uh, to increase its energy use uh, and uh, also the very uh, high risk to increase uh, the carbon emission. G given that fact, uh, Chinese uh, targets Chinese uh, uh, pace to reduce uh, greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide, will influence, or I would say, will determine the overall um, the overall pace uh, of global uh, climate agenda. Uh, so that mean, that means without uh, the deep engagement of China in uh, emission reduction there will be no way out for uh, the world, for the whole world to reach 1.5 degree. So uh, China is the, I would say China is the most important uh, the determinant to, uh, to achieve uh, 1.5 uh, degree uh, globally. So you probably heard um, uh, the US presidential climate envoy, uh, John Kerry said, that the world cannot solve the climate crisis without China's engagement and uh, commitment, uh, which you just mentioned that as well. But he also pushed China to do more uh, for climate. So in your opinion, uh, how ambitious is China's current commitment? And uh, should China do more? I can partially um, agree with uh, Secretary Jiang Kerry uh, certainly for the major uh, economies, uh, including China, uh, US, uh, European Union, Japan, et cetera, uh, the more they uh, reduce their emission, the better, uh, the safer to the whole world, uh, uh, to the whole global uh, climate. Uh, in this term, that's right. But on the other hand, uh, it, should not be as simple as just a calculation of the the the, the carbon bar budget, the uh, uh, the carbon targets, uh, especially the the reduction emission reduction targets. 
uh, rather it's also a matter of the drivers behind the scene. That means on one hand, I mean, uh, for example, in the uh, forum of the Paris Agreement or UNFCCC, you can negotiate the targets, I mean, party by party, country by country. But on the other hand, if there will be no collective cooperation uh, mechanism to allow uh, faster innovation of technology, to allow um, uh, the cooperation and the coordination of development by investment, by technology transfer, by trade, uh, there should be no way to achieve the target. Uh, having said that, um, I would, I prefer seeing um, uh, all the major parties, especially China and the US, should do more rather than only China should do more. And uh, especially, I would also, uh, is, uh, except for the target, I would also want to see the driver behind the scene, how to achieve the targets, what the pathway, what the major measures. So just to take a very immediate example, I mean, in Obama administration, for example, um, we, we see, we, we, we saw very clearly at that time uh, uh, that there was a, a shell gas revolution and that there was a very obvious and the tangible process for fuel switching, for power generation, I mean, from coal to natural gas. And these drive US emission trajectory uh, decline very uh, obviously, very significantly. And then we were significant to, to understand, uh, we, we, we were confident to understand the US trajectory, uh, trends of the tra uh, emission trajectory. Uh, I mean, when, the rapid uh, 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 fuel switching. But for the moment, uh, I am a little bit uh, concerned about the measures and the pathway for US to achieve the, uh, the target. I mean, now it's mainly the matter of fuel switching from gas to something else, for example, renewable. But how to achieve that? What, what about the investment? What, what about the, the, the technology learning curve in the coming decades? So, but certainly very similar thing for China. Uh, so except for the target, what's the real matter? What's the pathway sector by sector? I mean, power, steel, cement, uh, chemical and petrochemical, et cetera, et cetera. What, what do you want to, 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 to do? And the, the last point I would like to make a the institutional evolution. I mean, just to take a carbon market as an example, I believe in China, we still have a very long way to go. And uh, if we cannot uh, make uh, 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 progress, uh, I, I, I mean, adequate enough or fast enough, uh, there will be no way to achieve the, the commitment and the, the target. You, you mentioned a good point. US, both US China has to work uh, in order to contribute to, to the global uh, war, uh, tackling the global warming. Uh, I, I'll get back to that point uh, later. But first, I, I'd like to uh, further ask you, uh, ask you to further elaborate a little bit about this peak levels, about uh, you know, the carbon emissions before 2030, which you mentioned. Uh, but China right now hasn't specified uh, the peak level, uh, doesn't say what that number would be. So uh, could you suggest a, a peak number if possible or a range? Or uh, is it important to announce uh, as early as possible, like China would peak at a certain level of that? Because I read a news about you mentioned something like China could be earlier before 2030 and especially specify a year. But I would just hear from you to, to tell us, yeah. I know that, but certainly <laughs> uh, uh, telling the truth, uh, that's a little bit sensitive, but uh, I, okay. I would like to tell the truth, uh, try to be honest. Uh, in fact, uh, before I give you my answer, uh, I would say uh, according to uh, the real uh, theory of 
uh, economics, uh, it's not only the matter of uh, timing, but also the matter of income level, and uh, also the status of your uh, economic structure. Um, that that means the, uh, what what about the share of heavy industry? What about the, the share of uh, service, uh, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Uh, and the, what what's the nature of your manufacturer sectors? And uh, having said that, uh, in fact, when we try to estimate uh, the time on the picking level, we should look at the dynamics of economic development. That means the, the growth rate. The, uh, and also the co corresponding um, process of economic uh, structure. And uh, uh, having said that, I would say if uh, in the coming five to 10 years, if China can keep its growth rate uh, at 5.5 uh, to 6 uh, percent, uh, I would say China has the um, uh, a very high uh, probability to reach peak uh, uh, around 2025. I mean, at the end of the 14 February plan period, uh, but uh, uh, be careful here. I just say uh, high probability. That means we do have uh, the potential to achieve that. And uh, why I say that? Because uh, if you look look back uh, the trajectory in the past uh, decade, uh, I would say, uh, especially after uh, financial crisis uh, before 2010, I mean, uh, uh, China stepped into the new normal uh, stage when lower and the lower growth rate, when uh, inadequate effective demand in the market, and also uh, with the new demand in the market, especially um, uh, based on uh, the, the, the growing uh, middle class with 400, over 400 million population. And their demand uh, had been cha changing. And, uh, and uh, furthermore, I would say, I mean, just uh, relying on the heavy industry, I still, uh, chemical, cement, uh, building material. I mean, uh, relying on that, uh, China uh, will, uh, uh, a Chinese economy uh, 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 make its growth. I, I mean, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the past story. I mean, uh, in fact, the Chinese economy is, uh, had been delinked with carbon emission in the past uh, uh, decades. And uh, that means the growth, uh, if you look at the coolness curve, the growth rate of emission become lower and lower. And the China has stepped into the plateau, uh, uh, plateau uh, stage of peaking. Uh, and uh, uh, according to Energy Foundation China's estimate, estimation, uh, uh, around 40% of the current emission uh, volume had been in peaking plateau status already. And another 40% of the current emission uh, uh, is approaching the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the plateau status uh, uh, more and more. Having said that, we have around 80% of the emission had been uh, in the oh, very uh, uh, close to uh, the status of picking. But certain, certainly picking is not only a matter of a specific uh, time, time point, but it's a, a period. I mean, especially a plateau period of the emission. If you look at it, I mean, in the longer and the larger time frame, uh, we can say, China is approaching the uh, the peaking status uh, with another five years. If everything's okay, it's very likely. But certainly, uh, as a matter of uh, governmental commitment, uh, I mean, for all the government in all the the country, normally they would like to leave a room, a flexible room, 
I mean, for their commitment and in that way, they can overachieve the target or they can have more uh, flexibility. If something happened, uh, uh, they can say, okay, uh, this is not a delay for several years. Uh, this continue new to fall into our commitment. So that's a very natural governmental operation. So having said that, uh, I would say between 2025 to 2028, uh, this is very, very likely uh, for China to reach its peak. It's great to hear that number. Like during 2025 or 2028, it's very possible. If everything is right, China could peak earlier. That, that's good news. Uh, so could you just briefly mention like three top challenges for China to reach that goal? Top three. Um, just okay, uh, I would say uh, in my mind, but certainly different people, they might have different uh, uh, estimation, but uh, uh, in, in my mind, uh, there are two set of uh, uh, challenges or barriers. I mean, for picking, uh, I would say there are three top uh, challenges. The first one is social uh, mindset. I mean, it's a matter of value judgment. If the majority of the population, if the majority of the policymakers, they believe climate is a real risk. They believe, oh, uh, we, we do need to make contribution to uh, avoid climate change. Uh, uh, this is the, the, the top uh, challenge for China because uh, for whatever target you set up, after all, it should be, it must be implemented by people, by policymakers, by government, by business, by the, by the public. But if the, the, the stakeholders, they, they do not care about climate change, uh, there should be no success to achieve the, tar uh, to achieve the, uh, uh, the target. So this is why I believe uh, this is the top one challenge for the moment. Uh, I would say, uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, uh, only a very small group of people, they really believe climate is a real risk. Uh, the, the negative impact of climate change uh, is really, really uh, 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 harmful and really, really large for the next generation, even for the current generation. Uh, and uh, uh, although a lot of the local um, uh, officials, uh, a lot of the business, uh, business uh, they also follow the slogan of uh, carbon ne uh, neutrality or carbon picking, but I do not believe uh, it's adequate for them to really, uh, really to understand what does it mean by climate change? What does it mean by um, uh, climate mitigation and adaptation? Uh, so this is the first uh, uh, challenge. The second one, uh, I, uh, again, let me uh, 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 be frank. Um, I mean, the vested the interest group, especially from uh, high carbon, uh, sectors like uh, coal mining, coal fire power plant, et cetera, et cetera. And also some uh, energy or carbon intensive sectors like under steel, uh, cement building materials and uh, uh, coal based uh, uh, chemical, et cetera. Uh, they, uh, I would say uh, they are not so happy to make the transition from uh, high carbon economy to low carbon economy. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, I would say uh, they they resist uh, against the the, uh, the 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 transition. Uh, uh, this is the second one. The third one is uh, an institutional and the policy system ensuring incentive compatibility. Uh, these have not been uh, uh, set up. Uh, but certainly, I, I know uh, it's not easy. If we, we look back uh, 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 for the past uh, uh, around four decades, and uh, if you look back, the market-oriented reform, 
in China, uh, it takes time so for stock market, for uh, uh, real uh, estate market. Uh, after uh, three to four decades, you continue to see a lot of uh, uh, shortage there, and you need to uh, improve those institutional or uh, resource allocation mechanism. Uh, and uh, having said that, just again take a carbon market or carbon pricing as an example. This is a very important um, uh, institutional arrangement. Uh, we still have a very long way to go. Not easy uh, to do the uh, institutional reform, uh, but uh, this is something must. And uh, talking about uh, uh, carbon neutrality, I would uh, show another three top three uh, challenges. They are different. Uh, for uh, carbon neutrality, no need to say the social mindset will continue to be the top uh, 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 challenge. The second one is the progress is in some advanced technology, uh, R&D and the deployment. Uh, for example, hydrogen, uh, 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 hydrogen chain, uh, carbon dioxide removal technology, uh, carbon capture and use, use and uh, storage technology, and the nuclear uh, fusion, uh, among others. Uh, so that would determine the final pathway and the final pace to achieve carbon neutrality. Uh, those are the second uh, 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 challenges. And the, uh, the, the third one is, uh, again, an institutional and policy setting ensuring uh, incentive compatibility. So uh, there are different set of uh, priority uh, for uh, the challenges for picking and for neutrality. Thank you, Professor Zhou. So now I want to go to Dr. Ma, because um, financing, I think, probably is also very important for China to, to make its, uh, deliver its commitment. So Dr. Ma, uh, could you briefly describe China's green finance uh, initiative and uh, how did China finance its effort to become the world's uh, new renewable cha uh, champion and also the largest elect the electric vehicle market. So, cause that, that's also very important for China to deliver its climate goal. Hi, Dr. Ma. Um, your question on Chinese green finance, uh, um, we started off using this uh, concept in 2014, uh, when I was a chief economist in the PBOC Research Bureau, I led the task force on um, designing the uh, framework for green financial system. And initially, uh, not many people understood what green finance was. Um, and uh, we proposed uh, 14 actions to set up uh, such a system, which included taxonomy, disclosure requirements, products, and incentives. Um, over time, I think uh, uh, really last five, six years, the uh, green financial system expanded uh, drastically. We now have a system involving 14 trillion RMB worth of green loans. Uh, that's the largest uh, green lending market in the world. In the last five and a half years, China issued 1.6 trillion RMB worth of green bonds. Uh, that's the second largest green bond market in the world. Of course, the sector that you were referring to, uh, renewable energy, uh, electric vehicles, they are all beneficiaries of the uh, green financial system. Uh, either they received green loans or issued green bonds or uh, raised uh, you know, green money from the uh, uh, IPO uh, process and so on. Um, but broadly, I think it's a system uh, rather than a product. Uh, by system, let me elaborate it more. We need a definition of what green activities are so that uh, the green money can target uh, these uh, specific industries and projects. And secondly, uh, we need to have disclosure requirement, which means that the, those projects that deliver environmental benefits, uh, for example, electric vehicles and renewable energies, they can uh, reduce pollution, they can reduce emission, then they have to report um, how many tons of CO2 are they reducing, um, how many tons of SO2 and NOx are reducing. So such information uh, publicly released is very important to ensure that the, the green finance market is transparent and have integrity. 
And the products are also important. I just mentioned two or three products, but we need many, many of these products because different kinds of uh, uh, green companies, they require different type of financing. Uh, some probably just need a loan. Uh, some more innovative companies involving a lot of technology, they want a PE and VC. And uh, some probably very stressed um, and they need a, a debt equity swap. Um, and others probably don't need money, but they need insurance products. So we have insurance for green building, for renewable energy, uh, for green agriculture and so on and so forth. So it's becoming a, a hugely complex suite of green financial products meeting different demands from the uh, different aspects of the green economy. Um, in the uh, uh, international space, I think it's also very interesting. Uh, in 2016, uh, there was a global consensus on developing green finance. Uh, that was uh, in the uh, G20 um, process when China was the presidency. I think it was the first, first time the global leaders recognized that we need to uh, mobilize private sector money to finance the green economy. And uh, previously, I think most of the green finance practices in OECD country were taking what we call the bottom up approach. Uh, basically, private sector wanted to do that. And the government didn't realize the importance of organizing, convening such activities. And I think China made a lot of contribution in this process of forming a consensus as uh, uh, this green finance study group during G20 was launched by China. And China was the first one in the world to set up a green financial policy framework, which is top down, uh, meaning government organizing these arrangements. And I think it's becoming global consensus. It's a, uh, a system that requires top down and the bottom up efforts so that we enable trillions of dollars per year from the private sector to come into the green economy, including fighting climate change. Otherwise, there's no way uh, the uh, climate change agenda can be met uh, because public sector can only supply roughly 10% of funding that's needed. So Dr. Ma, you just mentioned the financing gap, uh, which is, a, is a, a huge question actually, almost for every country. Um, so um, so what is the estimated financing demand for China to reach its climate goal over the decades? Do you have a number on that or any research to support that numbers? Hmm. Yeah, there are quite a few different numbers. Uh, uh, about a year ago, Mr. Xie Zhenghua led a team uh, in Tsinghua University estimating that uh, China will need to spend uh, 170 trillion RMB in the coming three decades uh, in order to achieve carbon neutrality, or uh, not finally achieve, but uh, uh, during a 30 years or 40 year period to achieve the carbon neutrality, um, China needs 170 trillion. And a couple of other estimates from uh, CICC, from Goldman, I think they were all in the same range, 107, 100 something trillion. Um, and uh, we, namely the China Green Finance Committee that I chair, um, published a report very recently, just a few weeks ago. Uh, it's called Roadmap for Green Finance Under Carbon Neutrality. And that report shows that China uh, will need 487 trillion RMB in green and low carbon investments in the coming 30 years. Of course, it's not entirely decarbonization uh, because the green economy is a broader concept. Uh, we need to invest in low carbon activities, you know, such as renewable electric vehicle, um, green transportation, green building and so on. But we also need to invest in pollution control um, to deal with air pollution, water pollution, land contamination. We also need to protect biodiversity and ecosystem. So collectively, um, these demands, including the uh, decarbonization projects, will amount to 487 trillion, which is, I think, three times the, uh, the number uh, Xie Zhenghua presented back just one year ago. Okay. Uh, it's massive. Uh, on the one hand, it's opportunity for the financial sector. Um, nobody denies that financial sector will have to come in to the green finance space. Otherwise, they lose the biggest opportunity um, for, for profit. And at the uh, same time, it shows a challenge, how big the challenge is, how much money we need to spend. Yeah. So uh, in your opinion, how, how does China fill this gap? Because uh, these are huge numbers, either like 170 trillion or 487 trillion. So how, how would China to fill that gap? Uh, in what measures, in your opinion? Yeah. Uh, most of the gaps will be 
filled by the uh, financial system, uh, mobilizing private sector money. By financial system, we're talking about the banks, the uh, insurance companies, the asset managers, the capital markets, including the bond equity market, the PE and VC funds, and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, they also involve individuals. You know, everybody will deposit money in the banking system. Um, everybody will put some money into the pension system, and everybody will probably buy insurance, uh, you know, products uh, uh, by paying insurance premiums. So all these uh, individual money will eventually need to be channeled to green economy through the design of a green financial system, uh, which really means that the, the banks, the insurance company, asset managers, the capital market the process will be converted into a greener process so that uh, uh, it will be channeling the financial resources from individuals originally towards the uh, greener projects. We noticed China just launched a national carbon market in July after several years of pilots in several provinces. So currently it mandates only power sector um, and the carbon price is less than like eight US dollars per ton. Um, so what would be the direction for the future development of the carbon market in China? And what would you suggest to improve the trading mechanism to play uh, so that they can play a big role uh, for China to drive the uh, decarbonization? Actually, Professor Zhou is a, a uh, expert on carbon market, but I'll okay. take a first cut here. Um, the, the carbon market uh, in China, the national market it was just launched a couple of months ago. And it now covers, uh, I think the largest amount of emission in the world uh, because uh, just the, the uh, power company, um, they represent a very large chunk of a Chinese emission. And as you know, China represents about 30% of global emission. So uh, size wise, the uh, Chinese national market is already bigger uh, than the European uh, market. It's not about a liquidity, it's about the coverage of the companies that's emitting um, carbon. Now, in terms of uh, liquidity, pricing, and the functions of market in directing uh, future uh, green and low carbon activities, there are lots of uh, room uh, for further improvement. Um, from our finance uh, you know, perspective, we'd like to see financial sector, financial players being uh, involved so that the, the liquidity can be enhanced. And uh, with better liquidity, the pricing will be more efficient. And uh, in terms of allocation of the quota, uh, currently they are allocated, uh, they're given for free to the uh, companies, but in the future, we'd like to see uh, a growing portion of the quota to be auctioned to the uh, company uh, so that uh, they are aware that the, uh, these quotas come with a cost. And uh, of course, the quota themselves at the aggregate level need to be set in accordance with carbon neutrality goal uh, rather than independently. Um, and also derivative products need to be in place, um, which means that the uh, you know, futures and options and swaps and forwards will be, uh, should be made available to provide the risk management tools for the company and also to boost liquidity and enhance efficiency of the uh, carbon markets. Uh, but just one caveat on that discussion. Uh, now, a lot of people view carbon pricing as the only mean uh, or policy instrument to achieve carbon neutrality. That's a wrong uh, opinion in our view. Um, the uh, decarbonization process will be driven or assisted by many, many policies. Uh, carbon pricing is one of them, uh, probably one of the very important ones. Uh, but the other options are also available and sometimes are more conveniently used. For example, carbon taxation can be considered to cover many more companies, uh, probably a smaller uh, but carbon emitting companies. And green finance policies need to be introduced to incentivize uh, uh, low carbon activities and uh, to discourage high carbon activities. And the other expenditure and the taxation measures need to be in place. Uh, to encourage the usage of, for example, electric vehicles, uh, renewable energies, and uh, uh, all kinds of a low carbon, uh, high energy efficiency products and services. Um, and also regulation incentives uh, can be used. For example, Hainan province announced that uh, we're not gonna allow fossil fuel vehicles uh, after 10 years. That kind of policy is very powerful. Uh, they can play a similar role as carbon pricing is playing because they send a signal 
to the uh, manufacturing sector that uh, you're not going to produce you know, too many uh, fossil fuel cars anymore. It's after certain years, nobody's buying. Um, so uh, what I'm emphasizing here is that a concept of implicit carbon pricing, which means that all of these actions I just mentioned, they all have a impact on implicit carbon price, which will direct future investment behavior uh, into uh, decarbonization. So I want to I want to uh, bring bring up one uh, question, which is a coal, because obviously that's that's a, a, a core issues for China to 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 reach its climate goal. Uh, so I want both of you to talk about a little bit about the coal. But first, I want to just uh, uh, say that. So we noticed that China's President Xi uh, just announced that China will stop overseas financing of new coal power plants. So uh, that sets a great tone for the uh, COP26, which is Glasgow uh, Climate Summit upcoming like in, in all, uh, just one month. So um, I want to first ask uh, uh, Professor Zhou to talk about like, could you uh, uh, talk about what, what China, about China's domestic coal power plants at home? Cause that's still a, a big issue. Um, so how soon will China stop coal project domestically? In fact, uh, as you mentioned, uh, President Xi's uh, announcement, uh, is, uh, I, I mean, this is the first time for Chinese government uh, publicly uh, to launch a target for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, coal control. Uh, so the, the trajectory of coal use uh, here, is, I mean, in the coming five years, the increase of coal, uh, coal use uh, will uh, will be uh, stringently controlled. Uh, that means that the increase, uh, the, the increased rate, I mean, growth rate of coal use will be lower and lower, and hopefully reaching peak uh, around 2025. I mean, by the end of the 14 five year plan period, and then um, uh, starting uh, declining uh, uh, afterwards. Um, and for the moment, uh, maybe someone would show his or her concern, say, oh, look, now we have a shortage of electricity. We have a, sh a very high uh, price level of coal. Uh, and in this case, uh, how can we uh, control the increase of coal? We, we do need electricity and 70% uh, uh, of Chinese power generation uh, comes from coal, uh, coal-fired power plant, uh, and uh, how we do that. And in fact, I would say uh, in China, uh, there are two types of uh, shortage of electricity. One is the capacity, and another one is the generation. And uh, uh, in my view, uh, we have no urgent and uh, significant uh, shortage of uh, power generation annually, but we do have some uh, bottleneck for generation capacity in specific time period or in specific region. Uh, having said that, uh, let's think about how to address uh, uh, carbon, uh, 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 address electricity uh, shortage while we dealing the reliance on uh, uh, coal uh, with uh, economic growth. And um, that means that in the coming five years, the, the major target for coal control is the new or incremental capacity. That means we should not build up uh, additional uh, coal-fired power plant. But in the meanwhile, uh, we still have large room to adjust, uh, uh, I mean, from supply side and the demand side, uh, the balance in the grid, for, I mean, to meet the supply, uh, to, to meet the demand for, for electricity. Uh, and um, uh, in my view, power sector will be the hub, the key to control the key, uh, the, the, the coal. And that means, uh, around over 55% uh, or even uh, close to 60% of the coal uh, have been used for 
power generation. And if the power sector switched to uh, higher and higher non-fossil fuel uh, uh, generation, that means to introduce more and more renewable and uh, nuclear, uh, these will reduce the demand for coal. Uh, and then uh, we can further uh, develop uh, electrification for end user sectors like uh, industry, transport, building. And uh, in that way, we decarbonize the, the, the economy, Chinese economy, with less and less use of coal. But certainly, one thing I want to emphasize is uh, the, this is a decades level uh, uh, transition rather than one year transition. And uh, you cannot uh, uh, remove the coal just in one year or even in five years. Uh, my judgment is, I mean, within 10 years, uh, coal will be uh, keep the same for the first five years and then decline steadily for the later five years. And after 2030, or even a little bit later, I mean, 2035, there, there should be a very fast decline of coal together with very fast um, increase of non-fossil fuel. Back to uh, Dr. Ma. So what, what, what is your opinion uh, about the finance? How, how do they play? What, what's, what's finance role uh, in order to help China to face out the coal? Now on the financing side, it's uh, about uh, a judgment uh, regarding whether renewables and other facilities related to renewables are gonna make money. Uh, so it's critically important to, to show to the financial institutions, renewables such as solar, wind, um, and uh, uh, hydrogen, um, you know, uh, ultra high voltage transmission uh, and many other things are gonna make money uh, and with certainty uh, of uh, that future cash flow. So uh, still a lot of work need to be done um, despite the fact that uh, uh, some researchers are saying uh, the uh, um, solar and wind cost is lower already uh, than the uh, coal-fired power generation, uh, but the, it's a very case-by-case -case situation. Uh, sometimes lower, sometimes not lower. Uh, some places lower, other places not lower. And depending on certain conditions, uh, whether they can be uh, used uh, in the local or whether they can be uh, uh, mm, uh, connected to the power grids, and uh, uh, so it's a very complex situation in order to induce more investments. I think uh, um, such arrangements need to be uh, in place. Uncertainties need to be removed um, so that the financial you know, players can uh, make a decision to, to be more involved. I, I still want to throw one question to both of you about how US-China can collaborate on this. So obviously, um, um, there's a huge political hurdles need to be removed before the two countries can, can collaborate. But uh, if it happens, and uh, so in what exactly what area can two nations co collaborate in the climate, in the field of climate? So um, Professor Zhou, could you just briefly talk about it? Then I'll back to, uh, get back to Dr. Ma about that as well. US China, uh, how? would they collaborate in what areas about yeah, climate? Okay, uh, uh, very briefly, uh, I would say now we have seen uh, very obvious evidence. I mean, um, the bilateral uh, geopol uh, geopolitical relation had uh, influence on uh, the, the underground cooperation in climate area. Uh, if you, you saw it, uh, the result of the second visit of the Secretary John Kerry to China, and uh, you can feel that more and more. And uh, uh, but I, I would say, uh, for China and the U.S., uh, if we do want to have effective and productive cooperation for climate change, uh, there should be some bottom line for political trust. That means uh, for uh, uh, partners uh, in cooperation, they should trust uh, each other uh, uh, in an adequate 
uh, level. Um, and the, after all, it's a fact. I mean, the 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 dec final decision maker will address different policy objective, the energy security, air quality, uh, climate uh, development, uh, 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 trade dispute, security, et cetera, et cetera. So those different policy making will be made by a single government, a single body, political body. And uh, it's very hard to imagine so they say, oh, we cooperate for that, but uh, we uh, confront for the others. Uh, I mean, without bottom line. So that, that's very, very difficult. And having said that, I believe China and the US, I mean, for the politician, they should be aware of the necessity for the necessary uh, political trust. So that means uh, for the uh, relation between China and the US. Uh, there are three types of components. One is cooperation. The second one is uh, competition. The third one is uh, con uh, 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 confrontation. And we should avoid any confrontation. And uh, But for uh, competition, I, in fact, uh, myself, uh, in individual capacity, I welcome healthy uh, uh, competition. This may lead to uh, higher quality of service and the product uh, and the cheaper price. Y if this is the result of the competition, why not? Uh, and for cooperation, no need to say warmly welcome. And uh, so uh, based on that very, very general, but very overarching context, we can look at the specific area of uh, climate cooperation. No need to say uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of climate diplomacy, uh, China and the US uh, has had um, an experience to cooperate, to lead the global uh, agenda at the top one and the top two uh, uh, emitters uh, and also economies. Uh, and uh, we had the experience uh, to cooperate uh, for the Paris Agreement uh, based on the joint statement of China and the US. So that, that's a very good example. So let's see if we can partially repeat that. Uh, and uh, the upcoming Glasgow will be uh, 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 an opportunity for us, uh, for the two countries to catch up, to see if we can uh, uh, cooperate to ensure a successful uh, Glasgow. Uh, this is uh, one area. I mean, climate uh, di diplomacy or multilateral uh, forum like UNFCCC or uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, the second types of field uh, will be uh, on the ground, the programmatic cooperation, sector by sector, technology by technology. Uh, no need to say electric vehicle, hydrogen, CCS or CCUS or CDR, etc. So we have a plenty of um, uh, uh, area. I mean, very broad spectrum to cooperate. And the the third types of area will be the mainstream investment and the trade cooperation. In fact, uh, after all. Uh, I mean, the mitigation measure will be taken, will happen um, in the real economy uh, areas. Uh, I mean, from sector to sector, and uh, the two uh, uh, the two economy uh, can cooperate through the the uh, the, uh, the investment and the uh, trade for technology transfer for cheaper. Uh, response measure to climate change. After all, I mean, the fourth one, the last one, um, is uh, uh, academic cooperation. I mean, for the joint R&D, for the basic uh, science and the technology uh, 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 areas. Uh, I, I think we have a lot of uh, uh, areas uh, for cooperation, uh, but certainly again, the precondition is a healthy 
and the reliable and the stable uh, political condition and the relation. So back to Dr. Ma. So you have been uh, co-chairing the steering committee uh, for the green investment principles for the Belt and Road uh, launched, co-launched by China and the UK. And also you have represented China to co-chair the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. Uh, both in 2016 and 2018. So in your opinion, how would, could US and China work in the financing areas to contribute to the climate um, goals? US and China can work on two levels uh, for collaboration. One is international level, uh, because uh, US and China are the largest emitters and largest economies. Certainly if we can join our hands, uh, we're able to form a lot more consensus globally uh, on sustainability related issues. And that's demonstrated in this year's G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group, which I co-chair um, with uh, Larry from uh, US Treasury. And uh, this year we're expecting a major deliverable coming out of this joint work, uh, which is called G20 Sustainable Finance Roadmap. And that roadmap uh, hopefully um, to be published by end of uh, October will guide the uh, international organizations work in the coming few years in the sustainable finance space. Uh, so it's a success story uh, between China and US co-leading a international effort. Um, the other international platforms, uh, I think uh, uh, are also uh, rooms for collaboration between China and US, but not fully used yet. For example, the green investment principles, which China and UK launched back in 2018, now involves uh, 40, global institutions managing about 50 trillion US dollars. Uh, so far, uh, most of the participants are Chinese, uh, Europe, uh, UK, and emerging markets financial firms, but with no US participation. I'm hoping that the US financial institutions can be joining as well. Uh, and uh, let's make our joint efforts to promote greener investment, low carbon investment in emerging market economies. Um, another effort is called IPSF, International Platform for Sustainable Finance. That was launched by Europe and China and some other countries. Uh, again, US was not participating. And a key effort of IPSF was to develop a common ground taxonomy for sustainable finance based on the Chinese current taxonomy and European taxonomy. The first version of the common ground taxonomy will be out by end of this year, which I expect to be used by Chinese issuers and European issuers of green bonds. In uh, the other uh, markets, for example, the Chinese issuers, they can issue green bonds using the common taxonomy in European market, and European issuers can issue green bonds in Chinese market using this common taxonomy. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that the US can also join uh, this uh, process of global harmonization of system of finance standards. Now, coming back to bilateral, um, collaboration, there is limited uh, collaboration in the past couple of years, partly I think uh, similar to what Mr. Joe is saying, uh, there's a lack of political environment. Um, you know, for money to flow in and out between China and the US, um, the investors should feel secure. Uh, that's a key. Uh, if money goes to another market and they're unable to come back, uh, that's a very, very uh, uh, difficult calculation right, for most investors. That's why I think political trust at a very high level, um, you know, positive statements uh, from the two uh, governments on encouraging um, capital flows across the board, especially green and the sustainable ones is very important. That will provide a basis for confidence of financial firms between the two countries mm -hmm. to collaborate.